So last February, I believe it was, I had an opportunity to speak with you concerning the uh, history of the church in Bakersfield. And at that time, I tried to present some information about the uh, very beginning of, that, of this congregation. Today, I'd like to continue that idea with you, if I may, and uh, by starting out with a verse from 1 John that I know you're familiar with. Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So we're told not to love the world. But at the same time, in the same book, different, in the same Bible, different book, we find that Paul says this. I wrote you, we, this was read this morning, I wrote you in my letter not to associate with immoral people. I did not at all mean with the immoral people of this world or with the covetous, the swindlers, or with the idolaters, for then you would have to go out of the world. The verse that's not in the Bible, my favorite verse that's not in the Bible, is I want to live in the world, you are to live in the world, but not of it. That's, there is no single verse that says that. There's a couple of verses that go together that give that idea. But that is one of those cliches that I, I had fallen for for years. God has always expected his people to be connected with the world around him. We don't live in isolation. But it's one thing to live in the world, isn't it? And it's another to use it as a source of authority and behavior. And that's what we continually have to work at. And by looking at some of the people who lived before us and seeing some of the things that happened with them, then perhaps we can learn from both their mistakes and their successes. Now, what this is not in any way, shape, or form is a discussion about we need to follow our ancestors who did certain things 100 years ago or 50 years ago. We need to do what they did because they did it. That makes it right. That's not what we're talking about here at all. Instead, we're talking about how others lived in this world while, resist, while resisting being swallowed by it. One of the things that you'll notice, and I brought up last February, was this idea that as people opened up their Bibles, they noticed that there were certain things that stood out to them. There's the old story of the book that is wash up on one island and the equipment that comes with it. And another edition of the book and the equipment is washed up on another island. Two separate people read the book. They put together the machinery in the same way. Why? Because they follow the same directions. In the same way, we see that these are certain markers that people who are studying the New Testament notice. And these are things, brothers and sisters, that we need to know and we need to teach. And among them are that the general idea that the teaching and practices of the New Testament are used as a pattern for worship. There is a pattern. There's a common sense reading as a pattern. One doesn't have to be a logician. One doesn't have to understand logic and all of the syllogisms, which I never did do really well on in college because it was an 8 o'clock class and I didn't go to it. But beyond that... Uh, they don't have, we don't have to understand that. There's a common sense reasoning. One thing that we'll notice that stands out in the New Testament is that each congregation has a responsibility over its own affairs. You go to a church, you look around, you go, these seem like really good people. I like these people. They sound good. Ask yourself this question. Is this a congregation that has responsibility over its own affairs? Or in fact, is it in fact working under the directorship of another group? Baptism, it, by complete immersion, was necessary for the remission of sins. Not baptism as a way of entering the church, or baptism as a feeling good about oneself, or baptism simply because it's that time I feel I need to and everyone else is doing it, as you can find in the world, but baptism as a remission of sins. And I will tell you the problem that we have with this continually is we have people who are baptized in the world who don't really know why they're baptized but often will say, yeah, it's for the remission of sins, even though they've never been taught that. They've come to believe it over time. God will have to make that decision. 
But it's one of those things where if we talk about baptism in this really generic way, well, we need to be baptized to be a part of this group. What message are we leaving? And a weekly observance of the Lord's Supper, not monthly, not on special occasions. This is what J.M. Gilstrap, uh, James Monroe, James Monroe Gilstrap came to Bakersfield in the 1880s. He was, a, he was a farmer, a dentist, an inventor. He was a strange guy. He was a smart guy. He brought his own dental wagon. He lined it up in the 1880s about where the police headquarters is on Truxton. That was an empty lot at that time. And there he put up a tent and the church was established. Soon the church was overrun though, because at this time, not only were those people that were doing what we talked about before, but others had come in with separate ideas. See, to Gilstrap, one of the mottos that took place, mottos that took place at that time is, where the scriptures speak, we speak. Where the scriptures are silent, we are silent. And what that means is following a pattern found in the New Testament and not going on the pattern, beyond the pattern. He believed, for example, that the Christian church, Church of Christ, Christian church, disciples of Christ, often would wear the same, same nameplate on the church buildings, but they were slowly spreading apart because of beliefs. The Christian church had come to mean, if the Bible is silent about it, then we have nothing to say against it either. The silence of the Bible was permissive. Whatever is not explicitly condemned, we can do if we wish. And so it's two different mindsets that really won't meet up very long with each other until they spread apart. One is you have to have a pattern for everything, and if you don't have a pattern, you don't do it. Unless there's a some kind of pattern, whether it's specific or generic. And the other is, if it doesn't say you can't do it, you can do it. So the Bible contains every can't that, that is ever necessary. Anything else you can do. And you think I'm, you're exaggerating that, Larry. No, I'm not because that's a progressive world today. And so what happens is pretty soon that uh, the church has been dissolved. Instead, the Christian church is involved. Gilstrap comes back in 1905, and he commenced another meeting, this time on Baker Street, one block north of the streetcar line. What a wonderful world Bakersfield was in the early 1900s. Yes, it had electric streetcars. And at that time, you notice it was continuing each evening. The tent is well lighted, even at this time. What did they do? Comfortable chairs for all. I have to wonder about that. And I have to wonder about Bakersfield in July at night, how comfortable that tent was. But it was, notice as how this advertisement ends, a cordial invitation extended to all things. Here's our idea that we were talking about on the New Testament before. Prove all things and hold fast to that which is good. Paul. He doesn't even give the scripture. He just says, Paul wrote it. By 1914, when uh, Gilstrap literally drops dead of a heart attack in Delano, there is no church in Bakersfield. The congregation has fallen apart completely. It's gone. Instead, by 1921, an advertisement shows up that says all former members of the Church of Christ desirous of forwarding the work in this vicinity. Yeah, this is how people used to talk. Are requested to meet at the Woodman Hall, 18th and I Streets at 3.30, come on Larry, 3.30 p.m. tomorrow for communion service and for outlining plans for the future. Following the regular service, notice what they do here. Following the regular service, there will be a short session of Bible study with a lesson from the first chapter of the Gospel according to John. Bring Bibles for this study. That is the only advertisement that I have ever seen in the Bakersfield, California, that did any of the churches that said, bring your Bible to the study. They're putting in what's important. This has been put together basically by a lady who has come to Cal California in 1919. She has married a dentist. He's much older than her. Her name is Bertha Drain. And she becomes the person, in fact, the congregation meets in her home in the beginning. In 
In 1922, in the Gospel Advocate magazine, Mrs. P.M. Drain writes from Bakersfield Cow, 2425 8th Street. There's no house there anymore. It's been cleared. A faithful few are still holding the fort at Bakersfield. L.D. Perkins of Armona preaches here on the second Lord's Day of each month. It makes him a drive of 100, this is 1922, remember, 170 miles, yet he never seems wary in well-doing. E.M. West, another faithful soldier, preaches on the fourth Lord's Day. West was in Fresno and then also was in San Bernardino. If anyone has a relative or friend residing in or near Bakersfield, we would appreciate the addresses of such that we might interest them in their duty toward our Savior. This is the, the line that I thought was the most interesting. This is a nice country to live in and enjoy the temporal blessings, yet an easy place to forget God. Isn't that every place when you think about it? C.R. Nickel will begin a series of meetings here on the first Lord's Day in October and continue through the month. We would appreciate cooperation of the congregations over the state. Please remember the work here in your prayers. Again, E.M. West is coming from San Bernardino. If you just want to remember an idea of what the... Uh, grapevine used to be like in 1921 imagine taking this trip that's a partial view soon there's a series of small congregations up and down the valley they're mostly if you'll notice here in farm towns in fact the thing that seems to be the most interesting I, i'm going to get off the subject if i'm not careful because this is one of the things i that I, I'm fascinated by, who's in these towns? There's almost no small farmers. These are farm laborers who have come. These are migrants who have come. These, for the most part, aren't people that have stayed there for a long time and established communities. These are people that are there for a while and then leave somewhere else. But what they've done is they've brought their religion with them. And they brought the church with them. And soon... There's a whole series of these. When people look today and they go, well, there's no churches in these places anymore. They're right, there aren't. But one reason that there isn't is even 20 years after this, there wasn't because people have moved. Because they moved up the economic ladder, which we'll get into in just a minute. Here's the challenge that we have of change. And the point I want to make for us that I think we can get something out. When faced with possible changes... How do we decide whether Scripture directs something or is a custom? Can it be both? What did others do when faced with this challenge? When something shows up that has never shown up before and we're faced with that, well, what do we do with that as a group and as individuals? It's one thing living our lives in a regular way year after year after year, but we've all seen in the last few years that doesn't always work out. In 1920s in Texas, people questioned the Sunday school movement. In addition, another way of saying it is, they asked this question, is the Bible class arrangement scriptural? They had problems with the idea of a Sunday school. First of all, well, I won't get into what a Sunday school was in the world, because it was, it was separate, I'll just tell you, it was separate in part from churches. It had its own administration, and in many ways, it, it really didn't teach the Bible all that much, but it was a school on Sunday. So it was a Sunday school. Later, they added the Bible to it. Our class structure is a little different, but in the 1920s in Texas, there was a, a group of congregations that started saying, what's happening is the Sunday school is dividing the assembly. In other words, we meet together as a church, assemble together. Well, when you break that apart, we're not meeting together anymore. And particularly, they said, it's promoting women to a position of teaching. They may not be teaching over men in particular, but they are still teaching. And it's during the assembly. Do you see my point here? Whether you agree or not, it's important to kind of see their mindset. And finally, they said, all this came from a worldly origin. We can trace it back to England in the, in the early 1800s which is true. This is the Riverview Congregation on East Roberts Lane. This is the Riverview Church of Christ. It is a class, it is a congregation, I think it is still meeting, it doesn't have a website anymore, that, has, that does not have 
classes. It's a non-class. I try not to say no class because that doesn't sound good. It, it's a cheap joke, isn't it, really? Would you like to uh, people do it to you all the time? So it's a non-Sunday school, a non-class. With that group of people, another thing broke out about that same time, about 1928. That same, within that same group, they started questioning, can you have multiple cups? You see, until about 1918, you only had a single cup. And then it would be poured into others. What happened about 1918? Well, what you had from 1850 to about 1980 is you finally it took that long for people to get through their idea of the germ theory. You also had a series of diphtheria and other epidemics in the 19, early 19-teens. And so people said, we're going to start using communion cups. And they said, no, you cannot do that. Are multiple cups scriptural? No, the cup is the container. They said, when it, take this cup. They meant it's a container, not the ingredients. One loaf promotes unity, so you have to tear off from the one loaf. The cup signifies the covenant. That, I think, is, in my opinion, their weakest argument at all, because nowhere in the Scripture does it say anything about the cup representing. It says the cup is the, the blood is the covenant, not the cup. And so what happens is, from this particular group that has a class, no class, non-class thing, see, it's hard to do, then, from them, split another group off that said, we're going to have one cup. This is plans, well, I don't have it up here, but that's from the 1950s, Brenda Lane and Weed Patch Highway. Notice how they advertise in the paper, one cup, one loaf, no Sunday school. They've got it all very careful. That's on Plans Road today. If you go down by South High, the Plans Road congregation is there. And so they have been meeting there for 60 years. In 1925, at the 24th and O Street, there's a, there was a uh, school then. I think it was Longfellow, and Longfellow has been moved since then. But uh, at, that at that school, at morning service at 1030, preaching at 11 o'clock, communion subject, can a man do anything to be saved? Well, who's preaching here? Brother W.D. Hammett is in charge. This gives you an idea of what it was like in the 1930s. This is the kind of advertising that they found effective. If you're hungering to hear a real gospel sermon, come and hear Brother Hammett. I like that. I don't know. I mean, it's kind of, I look at it and I kind of wonder. If you find things about uh, Wilson Hammett, you're going to find that, I can go off on a subject on him too. Fascinating character. This man came out, with his family because they were starving in Texas. He associated with one cup, I believe, I know the non-class group. He was very aggressive uh, labor contractor. He was involved in some of the labor battles that some of us, most of us, don't even know took place in the valley in the 1920s and 30s. In fact, he was at Pixley when the farmers... Uh, who had hired off-duty police, the police came in with their guns and killed four farm workers, strikers, just shot them down. And he was, in fact, one of those involved in that and was called on as a major witness later. He's not in Bakersfield very long, so this congregation, and this is the point I'm trying to make, sometimes a congregation will pop up, those pop-up stores, congregations will pop up for a short time and they're not really successful, or the people will move on. Have we ever, does that sound odd to you? Does it sound like almost like there's, that can't be right. I mean, you could just start a congregation and then if you leave and there's no one else there, it just disappears? Yes. When challenged with these possible changes then, how do you decide? They were challenged with the idea of multiple cups. Unity was never a decision. Because there were other things involved besides the multiple cup and single cups. There was also a control factor. The same thing with the, the non-Sunday school. But other things were taking place. We were getting richer. In the 19th century, 
churches of Christ committed themselves to restoring what they described as original New Testament Christianity. For all these years, churches of Christ mostly were economically deprived and marginal to the larger culture. That's a simply a fancy way of saying we were poor. Churches of Christ were on the poor side of the town. There was a rich side of the town and a poor side of the town. Some of you know what I'm talking about because you grew up in small communities where that, that was pretty obvious. Churches of Christ were always on the, the poor side of town because that was the only place they could afford to be and gather and find a place to meet. But following World War I, the mainstream of Churches of Christ, in fact, began its quest for denominational respectability, at least according to Professor Hughes, who by him, by the way, is a very progressive member of the Churches of Christ. In fact, he's, if he's in it at all anymore. By not early 1928, the congregation that was meeting at the uh, KAP of the Knights of Pythias Hall at the corner of Kern and Lake. I wonder how many of you have ever been at the corner of Kern and Lake. I mean, how many of you even know there is a Kern and Lake Street? Did you know there's a canal in the middle of the Lake Street? And so it's, it's a strange place. Uh, so what happens? They split. And they split over preachers. One of the things that, I, in my opinion, this group needs to be uh, told and, and, what word am I looking for here, uh, given praise of how we have gone about handling a new preacher, another preacher. Preachers scare people. Preachers split congregations when they come. And for some, I know, some in the past, in some places, have resisted actually choosing having a preacher come in because they're afraid that person may have such a strong personality that they will split the group. It is a consistent problem. And it seems to be what happens here. I say that because the same people, P.L. Albany, is actually preaching for both groups. They're having the same groups get hold of meetings, the same people. The only thing that they're not doing is getting along with each other. Four years later, L. Eugene White, T.W. Phillips Jr. began a 14 days meeting here on April 11th, which means much for the church in the city. The two congregations which had been separated five years came back together in the meeting. There were also 16 added to the church during the meeting, nine by baptism. Large crowds attended. G.W. Riggs, Los Angeles, was present for the entire time and helped much. We meet at the very last sentence there. We meet in the Franklin School Auditorium. Some of you know where Franklin School is. So 1932, they're back together, but they're not. The very next week in the Bakersfield, Californian, the two congregations are still meeting separately. 1938, 10 years later, this is from a man who some of you may have heard of, an old Texas preacher named J.D. Tant. I mean, he's in his 80s by this time. My next stop was at Bakersfield, California. The church was divided there over the preacher. One faction had engaged me since April for a meeting. The other faction, as soon as they heard I was coming, engaged Tice Elkins, who was in uh, Albuquerque at that time, for the same time to run an opposition meeting. I went to their meeting and begged them to cut it out and come to our tent. Notice both are tent meetings. But their located preacher refused to come and the division still exists. But hope that time all at Bakersfield learned that division is sinful and let us work together. So 10 years later, they're still not working together. You say, Larry, this is terrible. Why are you telling us this? What happens when change occurs? How are we going to handle it? Are we going to work in unity or are we going to hold long-lasting grudges? We can learn from the past. It's not always positive. In 1913, 1912, George Pepperdine had an idea. He was going to sell mail-order car parts. You don't seem to be as thrilled about that as he was. Mail-order car parts and he called it the Automobile Supplies, and he called it the Western Auto Supply Agency. And what happens is, he starts in Kansas City, gets tuberculosis, moves to Denver, high altitude, clean air, they thought that would help at that time, moves to San Diego, 
moves to Los Angeles and makes so much money he doesn't know what to do with. Now, there's changes. What happens, with, what happens if you were given a, a billion dollars tomorrow? Well, I'd give it to every, would you? How? How? What he did, Pepperdine, is he set aside certain funds and he formed something called the Pepperdine Foundation. This nonprofit organization was created as a philanthropic trust in 1931. It was separate from the college, which didn't open its doors in South Central Los Angeles until 1937. If you're thinking this is a college, it's not. Pepperdine College shows up in 1937 in South Central LA. Why? Because that's where the people were. The rich people were elsewhere, but that's where the people were. Money from the foundation is used for many types of charitable causes. It's separate from the church. He is an elder at a couple of different congregations during the, his lifespan in Los Angeles. He's there for about 40 years. He lives that way long. But in this case, this foundation is separate from them. They give money for non-religious causes, but they also begin to give funds directly to congregations for their use as directed by the foundation. Part of the problem here that people complain about during this time is the foundation's trustees. They are wealthy. There's nothing wrong with that. They're interested in bettering their communities. For the non-religious part, they're active in their various denominations. There are Protestants. There, I think there are even a, a couple of Jews. There's some Catholics. They're, act, they're active in denomination, society, and politics. But when they start spending money in the Lord's church and directing it at certain places, they were also experts in publicity and advertising. This is the time when radio takes off. California, the churches of Christ have always been interested in whether it's the internet or other things. We seem to put things out. Very, we want to teach, so information goes out. The radio, KPMC, KMPC, KPMC, one of those was a 10,000-watt radio station at that time. And for 15 minutes, they hired, they, they bought time, and they did a radio thing. They couldn't afford it. So the congregations came together and gave money to one congregation to take over the responsibility for the whole thing. What did we say about churches not connecting with others? Out of this mindset, this publicity came what was probably the first religious advertising campaign in Bakersfield history, at least among congregations of churches of Christ. Uh, up until this time, what you're going to have is the assembly of God. You're going to have the kid who is, you know, seven years old, who can preach, or you're going to have the girl who can who give miracles, or you can have, you know, that's what they're advertising. But here, for the first time, you're starting to see a, a publicity campaign on purpose. Earlier churches, Church of Christ especially, had held weeks and month-long meetings, except they called them revivals. But now the more sophisticated and less church-like terms, meeting, gospel meeting, is starting to be used. Yeah, it hasn't always been a gospel meeting. It used to be a revival. All right? They're replacing the revival, not only the tense, but also the word itself. I can think of one other thing. I'll just share this because it's been on my mind. At this time, at the end of a prayer, it would be common, and this is when this started in the 1920s and 30s, when a public prayer would end, men in the congregation would say, true, true. Except they wouldn't say true. They would use the word that the Bible uses when it transliterates. They would say, amen. That's what amen means, true or truly. We don't do that anymore. We've lost that. Instead, we've gone to the beginning of the service when everybody says hello, and then everybody feels real comfortable to yell out, hello, good morning. But in saying amen... I'm not saying it's good or bad. I'm saying here's an example of change, whether you see it or not, whether it's good or bad, it depends on whether it's in your mind, I guess. But things do change. Now, in the New Testament, did you have to say amen at a, a sermon at the end of a prayer? Well, see, that's something you need to look and study. But it had become tradition. And it lasted up until just a few years ago. I remember even as a kid, 
And that wasn't a few years ago. Never mind. Here's August 1939. This is little bits and pieces from the Bakersfield, California. Uh, let's see. We'll be conducted Church of Christ in the morning according to Elder R.T. Golden, a layman specialized in church promotion and publicity, E.W. Elmore, public relations director of the George Pepperdine Foundation, will speak. Elmore will later become a, an elder here in Bakersfield at a congregation, and his son will be an elder at a couple of congregations for many, many years. Uh, a special announcement. I'm at that second thing up here. Uh, let's see. To the children, we'll deal with replicas of an original widow's mite brought back to this country from the Holy Land by George Pepperdine. A plan for obtaining these mites will be explained to the children. Publicity agents of the Bible will be the topic of E.W. Elmore. You thought my titles were bad. A layman who will lecture at Truxton Avenue Church of Christ. This is another in a series of promotions planned by Elder Stevens and R.T. Golden. I look down at the very last one. John Allen Hudson, Jr., Los Angeles, will speak on undenominational Christianity at a meeting of the Church of Christ. He has a large following in the younger set because at this time he's like 15 years old and he's preaching. As he's still in his teens, Elder R.T. Golden reported a large crowd last Sunday when the George Pepperdine College Quartet sang sacred songs. Dinner was spread in the basement for a social hour and a period of singing. This is one of the two congregations that's in Bakersfield. At this time, it's on Truxton. It moved around several different places. The other place stayed in, at the Knights of Pythias at Kern and Lake Street. You read almost nothing about them in terms of this. They give no advertising at all. This is all just this one place. 1940, yeah, that pretty well tells you what the headline is. Tells you the story. George Pepperdine Foundation has agreed to sponsor erection of a new building for Truxton Avenue Church of Christ. It was learned here this week following a conference by Elders R.T. Golden and Dallas C. Stevens with officials of the Foundation of Los Angeles. The congregation is now worshiping at 401 Truxton Avenue. That's about where the railroad, I think, is, the, the Amtrak thing, somewhere around in there. What's the point we're trying to make? This foundation is, in fact, saying, we'll build you your building. Changes. How's the group going to handle changes? That's the point I want us to get at. <laughs> 1941. Merger of the Truxton Avenue Church of Christ and K.A.P. Hall Church of Christ was affected yesterday. And the, No, it wasn't. I'm just going to stop you there. No, it wasn't. In 1941, they said, yes, they were. They used the term reverend quite a bit during this time. And that's mostly the newspaper people. They have no idea why we don't call people reverend. And they don't really care. Church, reverend. That's how they kind of bounce it and just do it that way. So take that into effect. But I will call your attention to the very last paragraph. This action was taken at a meeting at which local uh, officers conferred with John Allen Hudson, Los Angeles, James A. Scott, Long Beach, Samuel W. Witte of Ontario, Lloyd Smith of Fresno, and others. You say, well, they merged. No, they didn't. Because <laughs> that same month, this is what's in the advertisement. They continue to meet. There is a group that meets at Kern and Lake, and I get the idea they're not going to move over to Truxton. There's something different there. And by this time, there's something different besides, I just don't like you. By this time, it's something that they're saying, we don't feel really comfortable with some of the things going on. One more if I can. I just have a few minutes. I'm sorry. The challenge of change. In the 1930s, Sarah McGee came from Mississippi. She came to Bakersfield. She came to the congregation at Kern and Lake and the one at Truxton, and they both turned her away. Said, you cannot be here. She was black. Eventually, according to the California Ab website, Sister McGee, whether it's McGee or McGee, I'm still not sure, because they, they seem to spell it, the family seemed to spell it every which way or did, met Sister L.A. Brown, a white lady who lived on Lake Street, and the two became very close friends. The two began to worship in Sister Brown's home on Lake Street, which was in East Bakersfield. That's not correct. That's not correct. Because 
in the 1970s, Mrs. Bertha, Mrs. Ludie Brown, some of you may remember that name, actually, lived on Lake Street. But in the 1930s, she wasn't Ludie Brown, Mrs. Ludie Brown. She was Mrs. P, whatever it was, P.A. Drain. This is Bertha Drain, the same one that helped establish the church and in, in, in her house in 1921, now meets with Sarah McGee. And quite frankly, I think meeting with probably the preacher at the Kern and Lake Street, the white preacher, and holding services in her home. They call for Amos Lincoln Cassius. These are some people that, whatever they did later in life, in terms of my disagreement about institutionalism, just frank, quite frankly, what they did in terms of sacrifice. What Cassius did is he started congregations in Arizona, New Mexico, and California. He did so, he was a contractor, he'd worked himself up to be a builder con building contractor. A black building contractor was limited of what they could do. California was a segregated state, very segregated. And so what we see here is that in this case, he ca they call upon him, he holds a meeting for two weeks under an arbor. Yeah, they have a brush arbor on one of these side streets. They don't even have a tent to meet in. There's a directory of Churches of Christ, colored, that you can find in the 1930s and 40s. And in that, you'll see there's Bakersfield. It says that there's 37 people, and contact is Sarah A. McGee. So she's still the driving force in this community because they don't have a preacher. None of these people have preachers. When the Church of Christ broke off from the Christian church in 1906, I heard this from, from Ed Harrell one time, a historian. He said that probably about 10% of Churches of Christ, about 10% had located preachers where they actually could, could pay the preacher a salary and keep them there themselves. 10%. In the 1960s, in the institutional crisis, when the non-institutional group broke away, about 10% of them could afford that same thing. So this is a, these are people that are used to going without having people speak on a regular basis. Although they were young and didn't directly identify areas, Robert Lee's children may have said this. This is in a book by Calvin Bowers, Realizing the California Dream about Black Churches of Christ. And this is what it, the daughter and son said. Said, we were poor, and I always said I would never marry a preacher because they were the poorest men in town. Too late. And so Raymond added, I remember that we met in a rented hall and lived in a garage with a dirt floor. That was probably Bakersfield. That's life. That's where the family lived. Robert Lee will spend a couple of, out, couple of years in Bakersfield. They will build a building on Baker and Butte Street, and then it will move later to California. There's still other congregations that I haven't talked about, but I just want to leave you with this idea. Whether it's true or not, it's a great story, so it should be true. The Chinese supposedly have this statement, you know, if they want to kind of curse you in good terms, they'll say, we hope, we hope you live in eventful times. Now, as I said, that's probably not true, but it, I hope you see the point of why it would be a curse and not a blessing. We will live, we could very well be living in eventful times. We're going to be challenged as to what we do. We're going to be challenged as to whether we stay with the New Testament scriptures or whether we look at things and presume things, whether we look to what we used to do, whether something new has come in and we either kick it out because it's new or accept it immediately because it's new. These are things which is a group. We can't put this just on elders' shoulders. This is what the group has to be looking at and responsible for. And so in that case, that takes us to one last thing, and that is, well, let me get this one. Here's Marshall Keeble, here's R.N. Hogan, 
They both hold meetings. They baptize 86. And out of that 86, uh, 35 are whites. Because during this time period, when you would have a meeting like that, whites would sit on one side of the building, blacks would sit on the other. And if you went forward confessing your sins, a white evangelist would meet you here, a black evangelist would meet you here. Even to that time, the idea of a black evangelist taking a white, white Christian's statement was something, and before you start going, I wouldn't be like that. Not me. Well, an awful lot of people were, and they were, they're pretty smart. I'm not saying they were justified, but I'm saying if that's the only thing that you always assumed was right. Lee will travel to Los Angeles, go to a new school, because it's the only one that will take black, blacks as students, Pepperdine. Pepperdine is the only school. None of the others back east, Lipscomb, Harding, any of the others will accept black students. Only Pepperdine. And so Pepperdine will have a connection with black churches up to this day. It's more of a class than a sermon, but I hope it's something that you can, that has been beneficial to you. If you are among those people, like all of us that kind of go, I don't know. I don't know if I'm up to all this. Yes, you are. We all are. Because I believe that God gives us that, author that gives us that power when we need it. He gives us that comfort. He gives us that support. That's the word I'm looking for. And if you are one of those that perhaps need our help at this time, would you please come forward as together we stand and sing.